I'm sure you're all aware of the situation of peril in which the Amazon rainforest finds itself. And very large conservation organizations, uh, such as the World Wildlife Fund and, uh, and that sort of organization, are working very hard to preserve large tracts of the Amazon in situ and to essentially make large parks. And this is commendable and should certainly be done. But what is not being done is an effort to preserve human information about the rainforest. In other words, no effort is being made to conserve the heritage of the people who have lived in and adjacent to the rainforests over millennia. And my estimate would be that this information, which is extremely fragile, will be lost by some time after the turn of the century. It's not hard to understand why this is happening. It's a consequence of the impact of market economies on primitive, so-called primitive, pre-literate tribal people in the third world. In the case of the Amazon, the men are leaving the remote villages and going to work in sawmills and going to work as outboard motor uh, captains and mechanics and uh, the kind of transformation that always accompanies urbanization and the arrival of a money economy is taking place. Yet these people have a body of medical data that is has served them very well over thousands of years and now because they can are impressed with the values of western medicine and can buy all kinds of remedios at any uh, drug store in the city why the the uh, importance of this knowledge is no longer apparent to them and so it's being lost uh, I might just digress for a minute on that subject because I have a passionate feeling about it. Um, I have no reason to doubt the DEA statistics which say that 70% of the cocaine produced in South America is coming out of the Rio Ajaga Basin. Um, I know nothing about it. As a botanist, I can tell you that the Rio Ayaga is the richest floristically, the area richest in plant species in the entire Amazon basin. As near as we can tell, looking at the geohistory of the basin, at times it's been considerably drier. And during glaciations, when, when water is concentrated at the poles, uh, the wet the high rainfall areas of the Amazon diminish in size. The Rio Ayjaga is one of those areas that is always wet, and it has consequently uh, produced a fantastic speciation of plants. Uh, one uh, biogeographer, geologist, estimates that the Amazon basin has been above water continuously for 220 million years. This is as long as most places in the world, longer than most places. It's estimated that the Madagascan uh, plate, which is a relict plate that now comprises Seychelles, Mauritius, and the Malagasy Republic, has been above water. This is all, we're talking Eastern Africa, Indian Ocean here. That land has been above water 350 million years and is the oldest above water sites on the planet. But the Amazon basin, by virtue of heavy rainfall, continuous uh, lack of inundation, and being uh, tropical, has been like a laboratory for speciation, both of animals and plants so that the Rio Ayjaga, which is the concentrated center of this process, is like um, the most intense concentration of variegated species and genetic material on the planet. Well, 
uh, it should be made into a vast natural park. If that can't uh, be done, then it should be left alone. What the American government has decided is a better course is that it should be defoliated, that a chemical called spike should be aerial aerosol sprayed into the air over this valley in order to kill coca bushes. Well, I don't know who dreams this stuff up, but any one of you on the ground for 20 minutes in this scene would be convinced that nothing could be stupider, that this is essentially like burning down the forest to kill the ants, that uh, coca there may be a lot of it there, I don't know, but there's a lot of a lot of other stuff there, for sure. There are hundreds of distinct tribes, dozens of language groups, tens of thousands of unique species of plants and animals. It is floristically, faunistically, one of the five or six richest areas on the whole planet. And as if the inroads of capitalism and the inroads of Maoist politics and the inroads of capitalism were not enough, you're also going to get a bunch of clowns from the DEA who want to defoliate it. So, you know, if any of you have political pull or are the, the letter-writing type, uh, you might put some pressure uh, on anyone you know to halt this. This is really a kind of ecocidal atrocity, and if something isn't done, like all the other ecocidal atrocities, it'll be history before most people are even informed of what is going on. I mean, this is really uh, one of the great, great policy uh, wrong turnings for many, many reasons. I mean, I don't expect the State Department to be sympathetic to endangered plants, but what is happening is all of Peru is being pushed into the arms of Sindaro Luminoso, which is a, one of the most peculiar and radical political philosophies on the earth today. I mean, it rivals Pol Pot for having a no-holds-barred approach to dealing with its enemies, and Peru daily is being pushed into the arms of this extremely radical faction by a combination of mismanaged uh, Peruvian economic policies and mismanaged American policies uh, toward the campesinos, toward the poor people who grow the coca, because uh, they are seeing Sindaro as their only protector, their yeah, only yeah. hope. So it's a, it's a repeat performance of a sad story that has been seen in many parts of the world. Well, that's enough political polemics. What I thought I would do today is just briefly survey the world, looking at the shamanic options in the plant area trying to see just what is available, what are the history, chemistry, pharmacology, and botany uh, of the relevant uh, species. So I'll go through this. It's in the way of a survey. It's not uh, a rhetorical flight of fancy unless we lose control. Well, I've talked a lot about Africa in these meetings to set, talking about the emergence of culture and my belief that it was catalyzed into existence, language, and, uh, and complex neural processing by exposure to psilocybin mushrooms in the Velt situation of ancient Africa. So I think I've said enough about that. What I would talk about today regarding Africa is the um, existing cults or patterns of hallucinogenic uh, or shamanic plant usage in Africa. Africa is a special case because uh, it is, of all the continents, the continent most heavily impacted by human presence, because, of course, human beings evolved in Africa, fire was discovered and used in Africa before it was used anywhere else, and also the ecosystems of Africa had a particular fragility in relationship 
to the dryness that comes and goes with glaciations. So in spite of the fact that I propose Africa as the cradle of of uh, human emergence under the influence of uh, psychedelic plant synergies, today Africa is noticeably poor in hallucinogenic plants. The most interesting hallucinogen in the African uh, situation is Tabernantha iboga. Tabernantha iboga is a tree uh, in the Rubiaceae, or a small bush, depending on edaphic factors, that means soil factors can cause it to grow different ways. Tabernanthe iboga contains the alkaloid ibogaine. Ibogaine, it, it, there's a paradox about ibogaine, which is, of all the indole hallucinogens, it was the one most earliest to come to the attention of Western researchers. In the 1870s and 80s, when Belgium was uh, in control of the Congo and exporting huge amounts of ivory and gold uh, out of Africa, uh, entrepreneurs seized upon this plant, Tabernanthe boga, and created tonics where, that were compounded with it as the main ingredient. Uh, and it was sold as a tonic and an aphrodisiac, and in some cases it was understood to be an intoxicant. Um, much in the way that uh, Vina, Vini de Mariani, the famous coca preparation, which was the rage in the 1880s in Europe, much in the same way that it was marketed, iboga tonics were marketed uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, but the alkaloid was never very thoroughly studied after the turn of the century. And of all the indoles, we know less about this one. It has a complex molecular structure placing it closer in structural affinity to LSD than to any other psychoactive indole. It is, uh, yeah. Could you just say what an indole is? Oh, and indoles are a class of hallucinogens that are based on a um, molecular structure that involves a benzene group, which is a six-sided structure, attached to a what's called a pentexyl group, a five-sided structure. The six and the five... And then built off on them, there may be another six. That gives you the beta-carboline family. There may be uh, just a side chain. That gives you the tryptamine family. Or there may be more complex stereochemical uh, um, attachments. And they give you the LSD ibogaine type structure. So indole refers to a small family of psychoactive compounds, not necessarily all psychoactive compounds, not opiates, not tropanes, which are the things in Datura, not uh, um, the polyhydric alcohols of cannabis, tetrahydro, uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, but this particular small group of, of uh, plants united by this chemical structure that seems to, because of its affinities to serotonin, be the chemical structure that lays the basis for the most uh, psychoactive of the hallucinogens. Iboga is uh, used by the Fang people, most notably in Gabon and around uh, the capital city in Ghana and uh, in Nigeria and in Zaire. And it has an interesting and suggestive usage. First, let's deal with this question of aphrodisiac. As you know, an aphrodisiac is a chemical substance thought to make one either capable of or susceptible to sexual activity. And over thousands of years, this has been a recurring theme of fascination for human beings for obvious reasons. And the definition 
takes on different nuances in the hands of different people. Probably the best known af so-called aphrodisiac among ordinary folks is the so-called Spanish fly, which is cantharidine, the beetle, the um, uh, carapaces of a small desert beetle can be ground down to produce to yield cantharidine. And if you give someone cantharidine in a carefully calculated dose, well, they have a generalized reaction to it where they can gain relief from this reaction by having sex, but it is not a true aphrodisiac. It's more like a, a, a almost genital itching or something. It, it's a strongly localized in the erogenous zone kind of itching. And so this is like a pseudo-aphrodisiac. All CNS stimulants, all central nervous system stimulants in low doses present themselves as what's called arousal. I mentioned this yesterday. Attention to incoming detail, uh, slightly elevated blood pressure, so forth and so on. This is a precondition for sexual activity, but it is not um, a true aphrodisiac. In fact, when you sort through the many candidates for aphrodisiacs, and I'm sure, as you know, they range from powdered rhinoceros horn to mangoes to oysters to what have you, uh, interestingly enough, ibogaine is the only thing which actually seems to pass the test. Ibogaine is an aphrodisiac in the truest sense of the word, and I take that to mean this, that if you are interested in sexual activity, it promotes, facilitates, and enhances it. If you are not, it doesn't. It is not... You know, it doesn't overwhelm the intentions of the user. This seems to be one pathway that the psychic energy that it releases can be shunted down, uh, but that there are others. Uh, and paradoxically, the way it's used in the Fang society is um, it's a major force holding couples together. Uh, Fang society is quite complex and it's structured in such a way that there is a built-in high anxiety factor about women among men. The reason for this is an unusual set of customs which we don't really find duplicated anywhere else in the world and it goes like this. A man may have more than one wife a wife is always accompanied by a dowry. The dowry is always quite large in the sense that it is always a strain on the girl's family to get the dowry together. However, and when a woman marries, naturally, she and her dowry go to the village of her husband. But what is a little unusual in this situation is that divorce is very easy for the woman to obtain, number one. And number two, if a woman leaves her husband, the dowry must be returned. So men are in a constant dither about hanging on to women because the dowry must be returned even if it has been spent. And these are family relationships. These aren't relationships between a man and a girl's parents. These are relationships between two uh, filial structures. So it can become quite complicated. And in fact, Fang men between the ages of 25 and 45 spend enormous amounts of their lives making journeys to the villages of their wives or former wives, to negotiate dowry return. Because it is a, the concept of used goods is recognized. And so it isn't simply that the guy has to pay back the dowry. It's that he has to meet with the girl's family and argue with them about how much she was really worth. And this often ends in bloodshed. 
So into this social structure that is pre-structured for anxiety about women comes this psychedelic aphrodisiac uh, that promotes not only pair bonding but community bonding. And in fact it does so. And often when people are... The cult of Iboga is not the generalized cult of the Fang. They have many cults and, and do and some are Baptists and Mormons. And, but when a couple gets into trouble, the old men of the village, the shamans, will often say to them, why don't you join Bawiti, this cult? You're having marital problems. Why don't you join Bawiti, and perhaps you can avoid having to pay back your dowry. Perhaps your wife will reconsider and decide to stay with you. So it has actually become a very interesting force for social cohesion. And in fact, studies, sociological studies, have shown that members of the Bawiti cult have a divorce rate far below that of general Fang society. So uh, the, I spend so much time on this because this is a, an unusual role for a hallucinogen. We just don't see them playing these uh, secondary socially catalytic roles. Um, Iboga is a strong hallucinogen, and it's usually given to a person in very massive doses uh, at the initiatory exposure, which can come in late adolescence. People do die occasionally from it, but the amounts eaten are just almost beyond credibility or creditability. Uh, because they talk in terms of tablespoons, and people will go to the river and eat two tablespoons. Methods of preparing hauma and soma, which are very puzzling when you try to apply them to a mushroom, because there's all this talk about it's squeezed, it's filtered. A bunch of processes are described, which if you tried to carry them out on a mushroom would just leave you with a mess. Uh, but if you carry these processes out on Pergamon harmala, it quite reliably produces a yellow fluid, rich in harmaline. Harmaline is yellow, uh, that is probably an intoxicant. So this is an area where research needs to be done. Any of you who are interested in ayahuasca or interested in beta-carbolines in psychotherapy, uh, I urge you to look at Flattery's book. It's brand new. 1989, University of California Press, Near Eastern Studies, publication number 21, Haoma and Harmaline. Okay, um, moving on east then across the Iranian plateau into India, which is certainly the birthplace or, or a great cradle of uh, esoteric spirituality, what we discover is a surprising poverty of true, i.e. indole, hallucinogens. There are interesting substitutes, aside from Pergamon harmala, which I've mentioned, of which there is very little textual evidence for use in India. Uh, the two things which have to stand out in Indian um, uh, psycho-phyto-shamanism would be, uh, number one, Detura species, and we might as well talk about them now because we will meet them in, on every continent, and they are including in Africa. I just read an article about a group in Tanzania, interesting group, um, Detura fatuosa, taken by women only, in a women's initiation rite, which... Uh, I don't know how often this goes on, but it involves a labial measuring uh, rite. So everybody compares the size of their labia at the height of this trip. And <laughs> what is culturally sanctioned, uh, and this is a funny concept, which I'll talk about a little bit, is blue hallucinations. The women strive for blue hallucinations, and if they don't achieve them, it's considered like it wasn't really a successful initiation. 
and the anthropologist who wrote on this called this a culturally sanctioned hallucination. Well, now, I'm not sure what is meant here. Do they mean that or uh, anthropologists, white people, don't have blue hallucinations, they just have hallucinations, and that somehow it's expectation that directs this? I'm not sure. I don't associate blue hallucinations with trope pains, but it is certainly true that blue hallucinations attach themselves to ayahuasca, and e people have even called it the search for the blue flash. And if you've ever taken ayahuasca, you know that there is a moment when what appears to be uh, the world's entire supply of magenta jello is unleashed upon you and just flows toward you, past you, and through you. And it invariably is this electric, cerulean blue merging into uh, magenta, a very typical presentation of that. Okay, well, Datura species, many types, occur uh, throughout the world in the tropical and the temperate zone. There are several species in India, and uh, texts on yoga and on Indian spirituality never stress this. Use of Datura is quite strongly a part of religious, of Indian, well, sadhu type spirituality. It's too much for ordinary people. But you do see when you hang out with sadhus, little, the little prickly pods of datura are as common to find cast around about their dwelling places and gathering areas as are uh, the evidences of charas smoking. And that brings me to the second major component of the psychoactive flora of the subcontinent, which is uh, cannabis. Cannabis is not an indole, but cannabis must be considered a, um, a, a psychoactive plant of great age and human association. I mean, um, cannabis is hemp. Cannabis is the source of fiber for weaving. And we find uh, hemp and fibers in graves um, eight to 9,000 years old at Chatal Hyuyuk, for one place, a, a place I've talked a lot to you about. Uh, it's fascinating the way in which the metaphors of the weaver are the metaphors for human cognitive activity generally. In the 50s, a famous book was published called Man is a Weaver that pursued this theme but never made the connection to fibrous hemp. But we weave a tale, we tell a yarn, we have all these words, these fiber and weaving words that we connect to poetic or narrative activity. And, you know, most of us who are aficionados of cannabis in these latter days smoke it. But And don't smoke charas, uh, hashish, because it's rare in this country, but smoke uh, bud, uh, flowering tops of marijuana. But if you actually eat hashish, it, you, know, you can convince yourself this was the LSD of the ancient world in the 19th century. You know, Theodore Gautier and... Um, uh, Baudelaire and Verlaine, Rimbaud, that crowd. Uh, there was this thing called the Society of the Hashashin in Paris, and they met at the old Hotel de Leon uh, uh, on the left bank uh, and ate jellied uh, cannabis that they were getting from Morocco with little silver spoons. And the descriptions of these experiences make it clear that this was operating. They're not more florid or less florid than the descriptions of LSD that we get from Aldous Huxley and Tim Leary in the early 1960s. I mean, this stuff was taking them away. Uh, I don't advise you to eat uh, hashish or charas for a very practical reason, which is it's collected off people's hands. And uh, 
you know, the your immune system is just electrified by the presence of uh, all of this uh, uh, material that's been rubbed off of your hands. I suppose we could put it through an x-ray machine and then we could eat it uh, with impunity. But we can't sell short the spiritual power of cannabis, especially when eaten. Some of you may know this book, The Oracles and Demons of Tibet, by René Dinabisky Vojkovits. Vojkovits studied um, shamanism, was not interested in Tibetan Buddhism, but was interested in the pre-Buddhist strata. And in that book, there are pictures of Prinpo shamans intoxicated on hashish, uh, experiencing actually fits and near convulsions in an oracular trance uh, in a village uh, near Mustang. So uh, it is not a minor psychedelic substance at all. It's a very powerful psychedelic substance, especially when eaten and, uh, and when concentrated and then eaten. Opium is an Asian plant, but I'm not going to talk about it in the context of psychedelics. I think you know enough about opium and its history. What I will point out is the um, absence, the surprising absence of hallucinogens in the old world tropics. By the old world tropics, we mean um, the Indonesian tropics. This is an area that I'm very well familiar with from having spent a lot of time out there as a professional insect collector. Uh, in my my pre botany days, and um, there just are no major hallucinogenic plants in the Indonesian or Philippine or Southeast Asian tropics. There are certain suspect plants, uh, but none of them uh, do we encounter a living cult that would be a clue to this thing as a major item of human, spiritual, or cultural usage. Yeah, Marty. What are, the, uh, what are the magic mushrooms we hear about from Indonesia now that are available there, supposedly openly now, in omelets? And... When I was in Bali, this practice was absolutely unknown. This, the famous omelets of Denpasar and Kuta Beach and all that. And I think that until somebody argues differently, the most reasonable thing to assume is that coprophytic mushrooms, meaning dung-loving mushrooms, have just followed cattle around and around the world in the warm tropics. Now, the mushroom uh, that is most commonly offered tourists in Bali is not Strophaeria cubensis. It's a Coplandia. And uh, it's a weaker mushroom. There are a number of these dung-loving mushrooms that contain psilocybin, but almost all of them also contain an emetic, usually... Well, no, I don't want to say that. They just usually contain an emetic. It means makes you throw up. The Hawaiian mushrooms that people rave about are actually, from the point of view of someone who knows psilocybin mushrooms, a very inferior choice. Uh, if you go to Thailand, if you go to Koh Samui in the islands of the south, uh, you will be offered mushrooms. And I quickly understood that there was, a, to a certain degree, a shell game going on. And what it is, is this. The, the people selling the mushrooms have learned from the school of hard knocks that it's a bad idea to wire up naive Westerners with massive amounts of hallucinogenic drugs because then you get in trouble with the local constable and so forth. So unless you are on it in southern Thailand, what they will sell you are mushrooms that have grown in the dung of water buffalo. And right there in the next field over, there is the dung of Cebu cattle. And that has Strophaeria cubensis in it. But they try to steer you away from that because it's so much stronger. They just want people to get a buzz on. So if you're, deal if you're buying mushrooms in southern Thailand, try to see, try to go with the guy and collect them and see where they're coming from. 
Now, there's an easy test to tell these uh, Paniolus and Coplandia species from Strafaria. They will do what is called auto-digest. Some mushrooms do this and some don't. That means if you pick the mushroom and lay it on the, in the sun on a stone, if you come back in an hour or two and it's turned to slime, it was not Strafaria cubensis. It was a Coplandia or a Paniolus. They uh, literally dissolve themselves at death. And uh, this is not a quality of, uh, of Strafaria. There's been a lot of wondering about this thing, about why are there no hallucinogenic plants in the old world tropics when in the new world tropics, the Amazon basin, it is the most concentrated ecosystem for hallucinogenic plants. Well, the thinking is the tropics are the tropics. Who can imagine a set of evolutionary factors that would favor... Uh, the evolution of many species of hallucinogens in one hemisphere, but not in the other hemisphere. It's very hard to picture a mechanism, a, a Darwinian or, or neo-Darwinian mechanism, that would give you that result. Uh, so, different suggestions have been made. Uh, one is that um, actually there are as many hallucinogens in Indonesia as in South America, but because the Dutch have been there for 450 years, the level of indigenous culture, the primitiveness, so-called, of indigenous culture has been mucked with, and consequently the people have forgotten these things. Well, that's a good theory, but when a botanist, who is not an ethnographer, goes over the species lists, and looks at the suspect families of plants, you also don't find hallucinogens. You see, certain families of plants are highly suspect for hallucinogens. For instance, um, the leguminosae. This is the family of flowering trees with finely divided leaves. This is a typical leguminous tree, this locust-like thing here. And... Uh, they, they occur all over the world as trees and bushes. This is a family that always has a, a very exotic chemistry, not hallucinogens per se, but flavonoids, saponins, terpenes, susquaterpenes, all kinds of exotic tertiary byproducts. A mimosa is a typical example. Um, Another family that is uh, always suspect that you look at first is the Rubiaceae. We know this as the family that contains tea. And of course, caffeine is an alkaloid that is sequestered in the bean of this plant in surprising concentrations. But some of the Rubiaceae contain DMT and, uh, and other psychoactive compounds. Another family that is always uh, the, one of the first ones you check out are the euphorbs, the euphorbiaceae. These are the fleshy old world succulents that bleed latex when cut. They often have extremely poisonous or sometimes psychedelic principles in them. Okay, so much then for the old world. Uh, as you know... When there is ice at the poles, there are land bridges between Siberia and Alaska, and this is the route that most anthropologists believe the major migrations into the New World took. Well, now, an interesting consequence of this northern migration route to the New World, people didn't just set out on a trip from Manchuria to San Diego. This happened over centuries, millennia, that people would move a few miles and then have children and die. And, and so what it means is that cultures crossing into the New World had to go through a cold neck, the neck of cold land, a, a, fun, a floristically extremely restricted environment represented by the Arctic tundra. 
And we can imagine that this would have stripped away many traditions of plant usage as they moved north out of the areas where these plants occurred. So, uh, well, the role of cannabis is not clear, but for instance, no opium was carried to the New World by these ancient peoples. Uh, and in fact, very few plants at all. Cannabis is the one slightly puzzling exception. It may be that cannabis was carried to the New World by people crossing the Siberian land bridge. Um, cannabis does grow in Alaska under special conditions in short growing seasons, and it's possible that this happened. Uh, the closeness between cannabis sativa, the Mexican marijuana plant, the and by closeness I mean the botanical closeness to cannabis ruderales, the um, weed hemp of Central Asia indicates that probably these things were separated not too long ago. What has happened with cannabis speciation in Asia, you see, is that um, obviously even without the narcotic dimension to the cannabis plant, we can see that very early on there was pressure on it, uh, selective pressure by human beings to produce good fiber stock. So what you get in India is a division into fiber tribes and drug tribes in cannabis. And uh, the resin tribes are, you know, extremely uh, selected, heavily selected for the production of resin, and they are the source of the narcotic charas. Uh, Amanita muscaria, the hypothesized mushroom uh, soma in Wasson's view, and for sure a hallucinogen of use in Siberia among the Ostiaks, Koryaks, Kamchatka tribes, and Yakuts, this whole group of people, and by a coincidence of uh, scholarship, uh, you know, when scholars study a worldwide phenomenon of any sort, they like to have a baseline uh, area to compare everything else to. This is why, for instance, the volcanoes of Hawaii are the volcanoes of this planet. 